Hello. This in this video, we're going to cover um, the questions in the unit three review. So I just wanted to briefly go over the problems. I did do them previously again to conserve time on these videos. Um, as we get further, the problems just take a really long time to do, and so it's much faster video wise if I. Um, just do the steps and write it all down and then just explain what happened afterward, okay? That way you don't have to have the time that I'm actually writing. So I rewrote the problem exactly as it was, the integral from x to x squared of y over x dy. And so then I pulled this apart. So essentially what I did was I did one over x times y. And so the one over x is like a constant multiplier. And then the integral of y is y squared over two. So when I evaluated this, remember these things, these bounds are for the variable y. So I kept this guy on the outside because that's not what I'm going to be plugging the x squared and the x into. So I am plugging the x squared and the x into y. So this becomes x squared squared over two minus x squared over two. So I end up with x to the fourth over two minus x squared over two. And that one over x is still out in the front. Um, then we went ahead and we um, distributed this one over x. So that's where I got x to the fourth over 2x and x squared over 2x. And then I reduced by an x in each fraction. So I ended up with these two results. And since they have the same denominator, I just went ahead and wrote them over the same denominator altogether as one fraction. Okay, and so that's how I ended up with the response that I have here and it was um, deemed correct. So for number two, um, this one, I wrote it down exactly the same. So from three to five, one, uh, one, this five is part of the bottom next line, but one to the square root of X. And then the function is two Y E to the negative X dy dx. And so then I'm integrating the inside first with respect to Y. That means E to the X acts like a constant e to the negative x acts like a constant multiplier. And the integral of 2y is y squared, right? The derivative of 2y, I'm sorry, the derivative of y squared is 2y, OK? So this is the integral of the 2y. Then I evaluate that from 1 to x. So I plugged in the square root of x for y, and that makes the house go away. And then I plugged in the 1, and 1 squared is just 1. So remember, the square root of x squared takes the house away, so it's just x. And this constant multiplier is still there. Now, the way it's set up, it's ready for me to do integration by parts. So I let u equal um, anything that is a polynomial. So the u is x minus 1. So then dv is e to the negative x dx. And then the integral of e to the next e to the negative x is negative e to the negative x. And the derivative of x minus 1 is just 1 dx, or just dx, OK? So I replaced, um, or no, I didn't replace anything. I used the by parts formula. It's u, v minus the integral of v, d, u. So I have u here, which is x minus 1. Then I have um, v here, which is negative e to the negative x. And then my minus sign, my integral with the same bounds, and then v again. So this is v. V is again here. And then du. And du is just dx. So that's this dx right there. Um, then I went ahead and I distributed this e to the negative x. So I got negative x e to the negative x. And then a negative and a negative make positive 1 e to the negative x, or just positive e to the negative x. And then I integrated this. Um, and the integral of negative e to the negative x with respect to x is just e to the negative x. So this minus sign just came down. Then this is a positive e to the negative x. That's a negative e to the negative x. So those will cancel. And I just need to evaluate this expression at my bounds. So I plugged in 5 minus, and then I plugged in 3, OK? And then these turn into a plus sign. So I ended up with negative 5 e to the negative 5 plus 3e e to the negative 3. And it did mark that correct. So let me control zoom out. I was having to look at my computer from across my office. 
And so that's why everything's all zoomed in all crazy. Okay. So for this one, it said use an iterated integral to find the area of the function, okay? And so since it is a double integral, I do need to know where my x values are traveling, okay? And my y values. So what I like to do is I like to do like a rectangle like this. And then obviously my y values are going from zero to this function. And then, oh, I already wrote it right here. And then the x values, as I scan that rectangle across, it goes from zero to the x value five, okay? So, um, those are my bounds, which means those are going to be my um, bounds for integration. And then I'm just doing dy dx. So I did type in these bounds five up top on the first integral and then negative x squared plus 25 on the second. And then I have to actually evaluate it. So the integral of dy is just y. And then if I plug in my bounds, this stuff plugged in minus zero plugged in is just negative x squared plus 25. Then if I integrate each one of these terms with respect to x, I end up with negative x cubed over three plus 25 x evaluated at my bounds. So when I plug in five, I get this number. When I plug in five here, I get this number. And when I plug in zero to each of these, I just get one big fat zero, okay? Um, so essentially when I combine these numbers in my calculator, I ended up with 250 over three. And it did mark it correct, so we were good there. Now, number four, number four asked me to use a double integral, but it's in three dimensions. What that means is that where my Z is going, my Z is going from zero because it's above the X, Y plane up until it gets to this Z value, okay? Which means that the function that goes in here is gonna be eight minus two y minus that zero, okay? Kind of like when you evaluate, right? You plug in the second boundary and then you plug in the first. Well, when I do that, I just get eight minus two y. So that is the function that's going in here, okay? Since I don't have a third integral, that is the function that I'm gonna have to integrate, okay? Um, if this graph had gone below the z-axis, whatever that z-value is, that would have replaced this zero, okay? That doesn't happen often in our problems, but just to be mindful that it can happen and it, you might have a different value here. Um, but when I integrate this with respect to y, um, Oh, and notice that your X's, here we go, your X's are on this axis and they go from the zero corner up until four. And your Y values are on this axis, which go from zero in the corner until um, two. And so that's what told me that my Y's are going from zero to two and my X's were going from zero to four. Now I chose to put DY first. And since I did, I have to use the Y bounds in the inside, and then I put dx next, which means the outside bounds had to be the x values, okay? Had I chose it to do the other way around, I have to make sure that the corresponding bounds are in the right place, okay? So this dx goes with these bounds, and this dy goes with the inside bounds. And if you switch these, you're also gonna have to switch your bounds over, okay? So I did integrate eight with respect to y. I integrated negative two y with respect to y. And then I plugged in two and plugged in zero. When I plugged in two, I got 16 minus four. And when I plugged in zeros, I just got one big fat zero. So that's 12. So I'm integrating 12 with respect to x, which is 12x. And if I plug in four, I get 48. And if I plug in zero, I get zero. And so the ultimate uh, volume there is going to be 48. Cubic units, I don't know what those units are though. Okay, number five. Oops. So for number five, it asked us to do a double integral again of our, um, using these bounds. 
So we have z, x, y, and z, zero. Again, if I do x, y minus zero, it's just x, y. So that's the function that I'm gonna be um, evaluating. But I noticed that they did put dy first and then dx. So x is obviously go from zero to five since I'm in the first octant. That would be everything um, bigger than zero for both x, y, and z. Um, so I know that my x's are gonna go from zero to five. And then the y values would go from zero because I'm in that first octant up until this graph uh, y equals to x. So that's that image there. Um, and so then it's pretty straightforward. If the y is going from zero to x and the x is going from zero to five, we're gonna put those bounds on here. And then my function x, y minus zero is just x, y. So y here is gonna get integrated. X is gonna act like a constant multiplier. So I have y squared over two, plug in my x, plug in my zero. I get these quantities. Um, that's not really there because if you minus zero, it doesn't do anything. So it's just x times x squared over two which is x cubed over two. And then if I integrate this, I get x to the fourth over four, but there was already a two down there. So they get multiplied and that's where this eight came from. And then I evaluated, I plugged in eight, five, and then I plugged in zero. And my response was just 625 over eight. And so that was marked as correct. Okay, number six. Number six was this uh, triple or no double integral. So we have r, where am I? Here we go. We r squared sine cosine dr d theta. So I got to integrate with respect to dr first, which means sine cosine acts like a constant multiplier. And the integral of r squared is r cubed over three. So then I plugged in my four, I plugged in my zero, and in the end, I ended up with 63. So I'm still integrating 63 four over three, I said 63, but I meant 64 over three. When I, uh, I end up with that times sine, cosine, d theta. So I pulled the constant out, multiplier out, and then I let u equal sine, so then du would be cosine d theta. So then I replaced this with u and I replaced both of these guys, which is du. So my integral becomes 64, 64 over three u du, and when I integrate that, I get the 64 over three u squared over two. Um, remember these bounds were for theta, not for u. So I have to go back and plug back in what u was and it was sine. And now I can plug in my bounds, okay? And so when I plug in pi over four, sine of pi over four is actually square root of two over two. But if I square that, it ends up being one half. When I plug in zero, sine of zero is zero and zero squared is zero and then zero over two is zero, okay? So one half divided by two is one fourth. We know that this fraction just turns out to be a big fat zero. So really my answer is just 64 thirds times one fourth, which does, uh, it's 64 over 12, which reduces to 16 over three. And it did mark that correct. And I did draw it because it said that my dr, my r was going from zero to four. So that means my r's are starting at zero and then they're getting increasingly longer, right? Because they're eventually going to four. And then it also means that my theta is going from zero to pi over four. So all of these little markings that are going all the way out four radius they're gonna be happening for every single angle from zero to four pi over four, okay? So this should be like half, I think I drew it a little bit too much, but it's all right. Um, if, this were, if this were pi over four units and whatnot, then basically I'm filling this up with all of my radiuses going to four, and then it ends up becoming this little sector of a section, okay? And so it actually ends up being this. It's not a semicircle. It's not um, part of it up here and part of it down there. That would have required theta to go from negative pi over four to pi over four, but that's not what I had. I had from the angle zero to pi over four. And then this would have been if the angle was from zero to pi over two, okay? So you just you have to pay special attention to your angle and your radius. Okay, number seven. So we have here number seven. Um, and I fit number seven and number eight all on one. 
So I wrote down the same bounds. They wanted me to change it into polar coordinates. So um, I did go ahead and remember that this x squared plus y squared is the same as r squared. Um, I know that dy dx, when you do conversion to polar coordinates, you get r dr d theta. And then I had to draw this in order to tell you what r and theta were doing. So remember, 0 to pi over si or square root of 16 over pi is a circle with radius 4, but only the top half because it's only the positive um, square root. The negative square root would be graphed down here. But I'm not doing that. I'm going from 0 to the positive square root. Okay, So my rectangles are looking something like this. Okay, And then I'm swooping those um, rectangles from left from the left all the way to the right, starting at x equal to negative 4 and going all the way until I get to x equal to positive 4. So it truly is this entire semicircle space. So if I want to put that in rate uh, in r and theta, r is going from 0 to 4, so that would cover this whole line here. And then that whole line is just basically going to get rotated all the way around to the other side. Well, what angle has passed over to get all the way over here? That would be pi, okay? So my angle was going from zero to pi. And then, so I substituted, instead of these bounds, it's gonna be theta. It's always r dr d theta. So the r bounds go on the inside and then the theta bounds go on the outside. So I put the zero to pi for thetas and then zero to four for the r's. And then this function is gonna become r squared. So that function became r squared and the dy dx became r dr d theta. So I multiplied these two things together and I got r cubed, but it didn't ask me to actually, oh yeah, it did ask me to actually evaluate it, so I will. But I put my bounds, it did have dr on the inside and d theta on the outside, just like mine. And then they have this r cubed. So to evaluate that, I got to integrate with respect to r first. So I get r to the fourth over four. If I plug in four, I get 64. If I plug in zero, I get zero. So I'm just basically integrating 64 d theta, which is 64 times theta evaluated my bounds, zero to pi. So if I plug in pi and I plug in zero, I'm just going to get 64 times pi, which is 64 pi. And it did accept that as um, my response here for the, uh, essentially it's area. Now, use B, sorry. Um, this one is asking for the mass of the lam, lam, lamina, mass of lamina described by the inequalities given that its density is rho of xy, xy. Um, and the integrals are simpler, maybe simpler in polar coordinates. Not this one, for instance, because I'm literally a, rec a square actually. Zero to eight and zero to eight means I'm talking about a square. Here's zero, here's eight, and here's eight, and it's literally this square that is your region, okay? So if I'm gonna set up my integrals, it's gonna be my, I'm gonna do dy dx. So it's going to be my x uh, bounds on the outside, my y bounds on the inside, and then my function. And my function is rho. Rho was xy, so I plugged in xy. And then dy dx. Then I'm going to integrate the, with respect to y. So x acts like a constant multiplier, and the integral of y is y squared over 2. Then I'm going to plug in my bounds, and when I do, I get 13 minus, 32 minus 0. So I end up with 32x to integrate with respect to x. That happens to be 16x squared. And then if I plug in my eight and I plug in my zero, I get 16 times 64 minus zero, which is just 16 times 64, which ends up being 1024. Now, number nine. So for number nine, it says we are, um, I already know what this looks like in my brain, but it's going from zero to six and zero to six. So you've got these vertices of zero, zero, six, zero, zero, six, and six, six, which creates this region here, okay? 
So if I'm going to find the surface area, I do know that my X's are going from zero to six, my Y's are going from zero to six. But in order for me to use the surface area formula, I need to find the partial derivatives of this function. So the derivative of F with respect to X is just this coefficient seven. The derivative of F with respect to Y is gonna be this coefficient negative three. So the formula says to integrate with respect to your bounds, and so that's why I have my bounds as zero to six for y, zero to six for x. And the formula is the square root of one plus fx squared plus fy squared. And so that ends up being the square root of 59. And when I integrate square root of 59 dy, I get just square root of 59 times y, and I have to evaluate that from zero to six. So I end up with basically square root of 59 times six, and that's there. But I took it out of the integral instead of leaving it in because it is just a constant multiplier. And the integral of dx is x evaluated at my bounds. So when I plug in my bounds, I end up with 6 square root of 59 times 6. And that's where we ended up with 36 square root of 59. Now, number 10. Number 10 is a little bit lengthier. so. There we go, I'm trying to get it all in there. So for this one, it says find the surface area, but it gives me, and this one is actually easier in uh, polar coordinates, okay? So they gave me my bounds, which was this, which basically means the inside of a circle. But if you remember, x squared plus y squared is r squared. So you're literally saying that r squared is less than or equal to 25, which means that r um, is five in this situation, okay? So it's the inside of a circle centered at zero and the R is five, the radius is five. Now, if it's the inside of the whole circle, right? Then what is your angle going to? If it's the whole circle, your angle has to go from zero all the way around to 360, okay, or pi. So that's why my angle is zero to two pi. Now, for our partials, um, I'm going to take the partial derivative with respect to x, then I'm going to take the partial derivative with respect to y, and then I'm going to convert them, okay? So what I did here was I took the partial derivative with respect to x, which happened to be 2x. Here it happened to be negative 2y. And then um, x is the same as r cosine theta, and y is the same as r sine theta. And then we also know that from the polar coordinates conversions that dA is gonna be R, dR, d theta, okay? Um, and we know that that's because of the Jacobian, but we're not, uh, if it wasn't demonstrated or it should be demonstrated in the lecture notes, but if it wasn't, I'm sorry. But if you do follow the change of, um, if you use this for X and this for Y and you find the Jacobian, you turn, it turns out to be R, okay? So, that is gonna replace the dA. So I have the formula, square root of one plus fx squared in terms of r's and thetas, and then fy squared in terms of r's and thetas. And then my, my dA is gonna be r dr d theta. And my bounds are for r zero to five, because my radius goes from the center out to five. But then this line basically gets rotated over and over and over again until eventually it makes its way and it fills in this whole everything, right? For every single little degree of an angle, it will create that whole circle, okay? And so it has to go all the way around, which means my theta was from zero to two pi. So then I squared this, I got four r squared cosine squared. I squared this, I got positive four r squared sine squared. Um, I did two things. I factored out the 4r squared from these two terms. And then cosine squared plus sine squared is just one. So 4r squared times one is just 4r squared. And then here, I went ahead and let u equal what was inside the house. And then du would be 8r, which means that du over 8 would equal r dr. Okay, so R dr became du over eight. 
and this became the square root of u. So I put u, this is actually u to the one half, right? So I have the one eighth because the eighth downstairs. So I have the one eighth. And if I take the integral of u to the one half, I get u to the three halves divided by three halves or multiplied by the reciprocal of three halves, which is this. And so then these do simplify. And I end up, when I multiply the two fractions, I end up with one over 12. Now I also have to back sub so that I have this function in terms of r. So it becomes one plus four r squared raised to the three halves. Then I plugged in five. So this was 25 times four is 100 plus one is 101 raised to the three halves. Then I plugged in zero. This is zero. One plus zero is just one. So it was one to the three halves. And I still had to integrate the inner evaluate the integral from zero to two pi of d theta. So I got one over 12, 101 to the three halves, and then one to any power is just a one. And then I'm gonna evaluate theta between pi, two pi and zero. So if you do two pi minus zero, you just get two pi. And so that two pi is being multiplied by this. Well, two pi, one over 12 times two pi is where the pi over six came from. And then this factor just stayed right there with it. And so then this is my final answer and I typed it in exactly like that. Pi over six times parentheses 101 to the three halves minus one and it did mark it correct. So it's all good. Now let's see number 11. So for number 11, it's asking me to do a triple integral. So we have zero to two, zero to eight, zero to one, x plus y plus z. And the first, the first variable of integration is x. So the integral of x is x squared over two. The integral of this quote unquote constant is just that constant times x. And this quote unquote constant is just that constant times x. So when I plug in one, I'm gonna get one half y by itself and z by itself. When I plug in zero, I get a bunch of zeros. So I'm just subtracting one big fat zero. Then I integrated each one of these. So the integral of one half with respect to z is one half z. The integral of y with respect to d is y times z. And the integral of z with respect to z is z squared over two. So I plugged in my eight for Z. So that became four, this became eight Y, this became 32, and then zero, zero, and zero. So just subtracting one big fat zero. Then if I combine all my like terms, I end up with 36 plus eight Y. If I integrate with that with respect to Y, it becomes 36 Y plus four Y squared, evaluate from zero to two. I end up with 72 plus 16 minus two zeros which ends up being 88. And it did mark that response correct. Okay, now for number 12, um, I went ahead and drew this uh, graph in 3D. So remember to do that, you're basically filling out this chart. So if I make X and Y zero, it means this is gone and I just have Z equal to two. And so zero, zero, two is here and then up two units. And so it's this point right there. Then if I let Y and Z be zero, so this is zero and this is zero, I would have to add the X over and then X would equal two. So one, two, this is this X value and the Y is zero and the Z is zero. And then finally, if Z is zero and Y is zero, um, or I'm sorry, z is zero and x is zero. That means this term is missing. So I would just add y to both sides and I'd get y equal to two, which is why this is marked over here at two. Okay, so that's what, and if you connect the dots, right, that is what gives you your graph. And so it's this thing here and it goes all the way in that corner. So my Z, if I imagine a rectangle coming up 
right? Going up in the inside of it. So this is the bottom, this is the base of the rectangle, and this is like the tippy top, okay? And I'm in the corner of a room. Now, from the floor in the room to the height of this thing, however high it may be, that's where my Z values are going, from zero up into that, that graph. Then the Y values, well, what, hap what is happening here in the X, Y plane? So I can figure out what X is doing and what Y is doing, okay? Well, I drew it here. I know I have these two points, right? Two for Y and then two for X. So I put the two at one intercept and the two X intercept. And then I had to give come up with the equation. So obviously it has a positive two. Um, if you think of this equation, MX plus B, the M is obviously going to be uh, down two and over two. It's negative one. And then the Y intercept is going to be here, which is two. So it's the same thing as saying y equals negative x plus two, but you could also say two minus x. So the y is going from zero to two minus x, okay? It's going up this way. And then this rectangle is scanning from zero to two. And so that's the x bounds. So I set it up like this. The x's go from zero to two. The y's go from zero to two minus pi minus x. And then the z's go from 0 to 2 minus x minus y. Now number 13 wants us to use a triple integral to find the volume. So the um, it is easier to do this one in polar coordinates because if you notice, it's a circle. And circles are easier to do in polar coordinates. So I did go ahead and factor out a minus here. So this became positive x squared and positive y squared. And then that's just r squared. So this is really. Uh, transformed into 16 minus r squared. And um, if I look at the xy plane, I see that the radius is four there all the way around. Um, but so I know that in order for me to get this whole circle from uh, everything, I'm going to have to make my radius go from zero to four. So it could start at the center and then span its way across. But then I have to take this line and then just keep drawing them for every single angle. And eventually I'll have a filled in um, graph, right? But for now, to get from here all the way around is going to be from 0 to 2 pi, OK? And we already know when we're transforming rectangular coordinates to polar coordinates, we should have that Jacobian factor r dr d theta. So my function becomes I'm doing a triple. So I'm not going to have a function in here, OK? There's no function in there. But I'm going to evaluate it from 0 to pi 16 over r squared or minus i squared. Then uh, that's z. Okay, z is going from 0 to this. Now r is going from 0 to 4 just by looking at that unit circle. And theta is going from 0 to pi so that I can get all the little lines all the way across until I end up with 2 pi. So let's integrate with respect to dz first. r acts like a constant multiplier. So I have z evaluated from 0 to 16 minus r squared, which gives me 16 minus r squared minus 0, or just 16 minus r squared. I did go ahead and distribute this because I am going to have to differentiate with respect to r. So I got 16r minus r cubed. And when I integrate that with respect to r, I end up with 8v squared. Um, minus x to the fourth over four. So I'm going to evaluate this at four and I get 128 and minus 64. I'm going to evaluate them both at zero and I just get one big fat zero. So 128 minus 64 is 64. But the integral of d theta is just theta evaluated at my bounds zero to two pi. So when I plug in two pi minus zero, I just get two pi. 64 times 2 pi is where 128 pi came from. We're almost there. This one took me a while. It probably won't take as long to explain, but I just wrote down a lot of steps. So I did the same thing here when I graphed it. So like I covered um, x and y, and I got z equal to 2, which is up here. I covered these two, and I got x equal to 9. And then I covered those two and I got y equal to nine. And so this is the graph. 
And since this is the X, this is the Y, and this is the Z, I mark these same coordinates in the X and Y plane. So notice that the X value is nine and the Y value is nine. Well, the graph of this line is nine minus X, okay? Um, so then this one helps me determine, right? My Ys are going from zero to this line. Here we go. My Xs are gonna swoop these rectangles across the graph from zero to nine, excuse me. And then we know that Z is going to be from the X and Y plane, which is Z equals zero, up until it gets to the height of this uh, kind of like a prism in there. It's like a pyramid, okay? And so that will help me figure out my pyramid. It's going to go from zero to that equation. I just saw for Z, so I minus the 2X, minus the 2Y, and then divided by the 9. And that's how I got this. Now, I did simplify, though, that. I did 18 over 9, which is this. I did negative 2x over 9, which is negative 2 ninths x, and the same for the y. I got negative 2 ninths y. So when I evaluate my row function ky with respect to z, ky acts like a constant multiplier. So it's just z, and then I'm going to evaluate it in my bounds. So I end up with 2 minus 2 over 9x minus 2 over 9y. Then I went ahead. This is just a constant multiplier, but I did distribute my y, OK? So I ended up with 2y minus 2 ninths xy minus 2 ninths y squared. And then I left my constant multiplier out here. And the integral of y squared is, the integral of 2y is y squared. The integral of negative 2 ninths x is negative y, is negative 2 ninths x times y squared over 2. And then negative 2 ninths y squared is negative 2 ninths times y cubed over 3. And I still have to evaluate at these bounds, OK? So the first thing I did was I simplified this. Um, and I noticed that these twos will cancel. And so I get x, y squared over 9. And here, nothing cancels, but I multiply those together. And I get 2y cubed over 7. So I plug in um, 9 for y. So this is 9 minus x squared. This is x times 9 minus x squared. And this is 2 times 9 minus x squared, x cubed in this case. Each one of these terms has a 9 minus x, at least a 9 minus x squared. So I took it out. And then what that did was it left me with, um, where am I? It left me with this uh, coefficient 1. When I take this one out, I'm going to be left with x over 9. And when I take two of those out, I'm going to be left with 2 times 1 more over 27, which is what we have here. And then the square means it's one of these times another one, right? And eventually I foil it out, okay? But over here, I do need to distribute this negative 2 over 27. So I get, um, after simplifying everything, I get negative 2 over 3. And over here, if I multiply those, I end up with 2 over 27x. So I went ahead and got a common denominator for these two and combined my x's together. It's just negative 1x over 27. And then I combine my like terms here and I did one minus two thirds and I got one third. And so then I had to foil these out. So I did 81 times one third, which is 27, 81 times this fraction, which is negative three X. And then negative 18 times this, which is negative 16 X, negative 18 X times negative X over 27 reduces to positive um, two X squared over three. Then one time or X squared, times one third is x squared over three, x squared times negative x over 27 is negative x cubed over 27. I did go ahead and combine my like terms here and my like terms there. And then the other two terms, the constant and the x cubed term stayed exactly the same. But I still need to integrate that. So I integrated with respect to x. So I got 27x minus nine x squared over two, plus x cubed over three minus x to the fourth over four, but there was already a something down there. There was already a 27 down there. So four times 27 is where 108 came from. Um, and then I evaluated at nine. So when I plugged in nine, I ended up with this number, this number, this number, and this number. And then once we were, um, we combined all of our like terms together. We ended up with 24 over four. And so I did type in 24, 243, I'm sorry, over four, okay. 
Now, if I want to find y bar, I have to find mxz, which basically means the row function, but times an extra variable y. So here I actually have ky squared. And if I integrate that with respect to z, it's like ky squared times z evaluated these bounds, which gives me ky squared times this quantity. Then what I did was I went ahead and distributed the y squared to everybody. So I ended up with these three terms. And so then I went ahead and integrated. So this integrating this term with respect to y would be two y cubed over three. This one would be negative two. Um, oh, this is like a constant multiplier. So it's just two ninths x times y cubed over three. Here, this is like constant multiplier. So it's negative two ninths times y to the fourth over four which I cleaned it up a little bit, I did two things. So one, I reduced this, and that's where I got one over 18 from. And then I plugged in that for y, so I have nine minus x to the fourth over 18. Here, I still have the two x in the numerator, and nine times three is 27, the denominator. But when I plug in nine minus x, it's nine minus x cubed here. And here, it's two thirds, but then times the nine minus x, parentheses cubed, okay? So then what I did was I took out the common factor. I noticed that each one of them had an x cubed, x minus, nine minus x cubed. And so then I also noticed that they have a common denominator of 54, so I took out the 54. So I did um, three, three or 54 divided by three was 18 times the two that was already there and this guy came out. Same thing here, I did 54 divided by 27. I got two, so this two times the two X that was already there, and then this nine minus X squared I already took out. Finally, we move over to here, so 54 divided by 18 was three, and then three gets multiplied by what was up here, um, but one of them, three of them are gone, so I only have one left, okay? So this ends up being 36, minus four X, this ends up being negative 27 and positive three X. And this first fraction just stays the same. French fraction is still the same, but if I combine my like terms in here, I end up with nine minus X, which means if I have one of them here, three of them there, I actually have four of them all together, okay? So if you let U equal nine minus X, then DU would equal negative DX. So I turn this into U, this stayed to four, and then dx becomes du over negative one. So I put the negative out in the front over here with the k over 54, and I have u to the fourth. But before I can, um, I first have to integrate this, so it's u fifth over five. And before I can plug in those bounds, I have to fact substitute. So what was u? u was nine minus x. So it's actually nine minus x to the fifth power over five. And when I plug in nine, I get zero, five is zero, over five is still zero. But when I plug in zero, I get nine minus nine, which is zero, raised to the fifth power, which is zero, divided by two, it's still zero. And so I end up with the other number, okay? This one here, I don't know. Yeah, when you plug in zero, you just get nine. So nine to the fifth and then over five. Now nine to the fifth was this big number, and then there's 54 times five, which is 270, and the negative times the negative is why it turned to positive. But this I did reduce by 27, so I divided the top by 27, and I divided the bottom by 27, and I could not reduce this anymore, so I just left it like that. Okay, we've got about, oh. In order for me to find y bar, I have to do mxz divided by m. So here's the expression I got for mxz. Here's the expression I got for m. I multiplied by the reciprocal of m. And then I simplified both of these by 250, 243. And so I got nine. I reduced both of these by two. And I got two here. And I got five here. So what I end up with in k and k cancel two. I end up with nine times two, which is 18, over five all by itself. Um, at the bottom. And that is the correct response that they have here in the website. So now we're going to move to number 15. 
And I do have my bounds the same, negative one to three, zero to pi over two, zero to seven, r cosine theta dr d theta dz. So I do need to integrate with respect to r first. So this guy's gonna act like a constant multiplier. So I get r squared over two, plug in the seven, plug in the zero, end up with 49 over two, okay? Then what we're gonna do is we're gonna integrate, we're gonna integrate with respect to theta, cosine of theta. The integral of cosine of theta is sine theta, but I have to evaluate it at those bounds. Well, sine of pi over two is one and sine of zero is zero. So I just end up with the integral of 49 over two. Since I'm integrating with respect to z, it's gonna be 49 over two z evaluated from negative one to three. So I end up with 49 over two, three minus negative one, which ends up being three plus one. So I get 49 over two times four, which is just 98. And it did mark that correct. So number 16. Number 16, I wrote down the same, zero to pi over two, zero to pi, zero to sine theta. Three cosine phi, rho squared, d rho, d theta, d phi. So I am integrating with respect to rho first. So this three cosine phi is gonna act like a constant multiplier. And the integral of phi, I'm sorry, the integral of rho squared is rho cubed over three. That three will cancel with the three over here. So I'm just gonna be plugging in my bounds into rho cubed. So I have the cosine phi, and when I plug in sine, I get sine cubed phi theta. And when I plug in um, zero, it would just be zero over three, which is still zero. So then now I'm going to, it's just like I have sine cubed. I broke up the sine into sine squared times sine. And then I broke up the sine squared into one minus cosine squared. So then I can let u equal cosine theta, du equal negative sine theta d theta, which means if I divide by negative one, du over negative one is sine theta d theta. So here we go. Um, cosine phi stays the same, one minus, and instead of cosine squared, it's u squared. And then instead of, um, sine theta d theta, we're using du over negative one, and then there's your d rho. So this negative I brought to the front, and I did integrate both of these with respect to u. So the integral here is one, the integral here is u cubed over three. I do have to evaluate it at theta zero to pi. So what was u? u was cosine of theta. So this really reads cosine of theta minus cosine of theta cubed over three. Now, if I plug in pi, the cosine of pi is negative one, negative one cubed is negative one, then zero cosine of zero is one, cosine of zero is one cubed over three is one third. So these become a big plus sign, and then this minus does distribute, okay, making this one also a plus. So I end up with negative one minus one, which is negative two, and then positive one plus one. So I end up with negative two plus two thirds. And if you type that in the calculator, it tells you it's four thirds, negative four thirds. So I end up with negative four thirds when I do all these computations of numbers. So what is the integral of, um, remember this is the same thing as saying just positive. You have a negative times a negative, So it's like doing this integral, okay? But when you do this integral, you have your constant multiplier and the integral of cosine is sine. And then evaluate it from zero to two pi. So when I plug in pi over two, I the sine of pi over two is one. The sine of zero is zero. So I have four thirds times one, which is just four thirds. And it did accept that as my response. Last two problems, number 17 and number 18. So this one says for me to find the Jacobian. In order for me to do that, I do distribute these one halves. So I end up with X equal to negative one fifth U plus one fifth U, Y equaling positive one fifth U and then V equal positive one fifth U. So the Jacobian formula is X, the derivative of X with respect to U, 
derivative of y with respect to u, derivative of x with respect to v, derivative of y with respect to v. So the derivative here of u is going to be negative one fifth. The derivative here of v is going to be positive one fifth. The derivative here of u is going to be one fifth. And the derivative here of v is going to be one fifth. So I did punt multiplier. I got negative 125 minus positive 125. Well, a negative 125 minus 125 ends up being a negative 2 over 25. And so that was the Jacobian there. Now, number 18 wants me to actually compute the area. So I have to convert everything over, OK? So I need to know what this is going to look like in um, a transposed graph, OK? So they do give me this function here. They do give me x and y. And so for 0, 0, I have x is 0 and y is 0. So both of those became 0, and the right side of the equation is just stayed the same. Since u is already solved for, I'm just going to plug u into the top one. So I get 0 plus equals 0 plus v, which tells us that 0 equals v. So we got 0 for u and then 0 for v. And so that's this point right here. Now, if we move on to the next point on their little image, you're talking about 5, 5 now. So that means x is 5 and y is 5. And so since I know that u is equal to 5, if I plug that in there, right, then I get a minus 5 over and I get that v equals 0. So now I'm talking at this point. It's, zero, it's 5 halves comma 0. Or I'm sorry, 5 comma 0. Then the next point is 11 comma 5. So 11 for x, 5 for y. And I end up with u equal to 5. But if I plug that in here, I get 11 equals 5 plus v minus 5 on both sides. You get 6 equals v. So u was 5 and 6 was v. So then I have 0 for the x for the u coordinate. But then I have 6 for the v coordinate. And it ends up there. And then the last one is um, this point down here, 6, 0. So x is 6, y is 0. Plug that in. I basically end up getting that v equals 6, and u was 0. So we have 0 for u, and then 6 for v. And when you graph that, it really does help, because then the graph tells you that u, I wrote it down here, it tells you that u goes from 0 to 5, right? These are your u variables. This is your v variables. And then the v is going from 0 to 6. And so there's my bounds right there. I do need to convert the function itself. So I did uh, y parentheses x minus y is the same as saying u for y and u for y. But x is u plus v. So this was x minus, and this was y. So I end up with u times v which is what we have here. So this integral is going to become the integral of u, v, of course, with respect to my new surface, my new uh, space. So my bounds for, I just put du, dv. I could have done it the other way around. doesn't matter. du, dv means the u's, or the v's, I'm sorry, are on the outside. So v's go from 0 to 6, just like this image up here. And x's go from 0 to 5. So I integrated that with respect to u. So v acts like a constant multiplier, and the integral of u is u squared over 2. I plugged in the 5, plugged in the 1. I ended up with 25 over 2. Um, and then if I keep the 25 over 2 as a constant multiplier, I'm going to integrate v, and I get v squared over 2. But since there's already a 2, that 2 times the new 2 gives me a 4. And then if I plug in the 6, I get 25 times 36 over 4, which is 225 altogether. And then if you plug in the 0, you're just going to get one big fat 0. So the response here was 225. And that is finally the end. I mean, I was just going and going and going, trying to get it done. You can pause. You can rewind, fast forward, anything you need to do to help you um, get through these problems and hear me clearly what I'm saying, OK? But please try the review, and that will definitely help you prepare for the test. But other than that, you guys have a great day. Bye.